And we're back. Greetings, everyone. This is Lucian Vilsan broadcasting from Cluj Napoca, Transylvania, the misogynistic capital of Transylvania, as we'll soon find out. As always, alongside with me is Herr Jon Gunnarsson broadcasting from Deutschland and our producer James Huff making sure everything works just fine broadcasting from the States. Greetings, Jon. Good evening. How are you doing? I'm doing fine. I, I haven't been so happy f for the last two months or so, and I have no idea why, but I'm just in a very, very good mood. It's probably because of the weather. It has gotten significantly better in the last week. Uh, remarkably warm, remarkably easy to go out as opposed to the previous periods when you'd have to spend 30 minutes to get dressed. Yeah, that sounds good. Uh, on my end, it's not, it's not been that good. It's been quite a bit of rain these last couple of days, so that sucks, but uh, what can you do? Yeah, I finally got we finally got rid of the rain. I mean, it, it's been been a pain in the ass for uh, days on end, and finally got rid of that. Uh, so yeah, uh, I, I don't know. Maybe that's why I'm uh, so happy. Because otherwise, news-wise, I'm not happy because there's such a huge dearth of news. Where the hell is everyone? <laughs> yeah, maybe they're taking a break. Yeah, again. <laughs> <laughs> They've been taking a break for the entire month of January. Then yeah, but finally... they come on there, they're covering some very important issues, as we'll see in this episode. Fair enough, fair enough. But nevertheless, quantitatively, as an amount speaking, there, there's just not enough quantity. Um, <laughs> but, but I guess we get, we, we get a lot more airtime to poke fun at them, because <laughs> since there are so few stories. Okay, let's begin with one that's uh, at least... Uh... That is actually quite serious. I think it's the only one serious. <laughs> yeah, probably. Okay. From The Guardian, male construction workers at greater risk of suicide study finds. Men working in the construction industry and women employed in culture, media, and sports, healthcare, and primary school teaching are at the highest risk of suicide, official figures for England suggest. The research commissioned by Public Health England, PHE, found holes in the found people in roles as managers, directors, and senior officials, the highest paid occupation group, had the lowest risk of suicide. The Office for National Statistics, or ONS, looked at all 18,998 18, uh, deaths of people aged 20 to 64, a rate of about uh, 12 deaths for every 100,000 people per year, who killed themselves in England between uh, 2011 and 2015. Of these records, uh, 13,232 had information on the deceased's occupation. Suicide is a leading cause of death for men under 50, and about four in five, um, 1,688 deaths in the analysis were men. The ONS found low-skilled male construction workers at the greatest risk at uh, 3.7 times above the national average. Building finishing trades, including plasterers, painters, and, de and decorators, had a risk twice the national average, and the risk for low-skilled workers in the process plant operations was 2.6 times higher. The agricultural sector also carried an elevated risk for men, more than 1.5 times above the average for both low-skilled and high-skilled workers. For women, the risk was elevated among those working in culture, media, and sport occupations at uh, 0.69 times higher than the national average, compared with uh, 0.2 times higher for men. The risk of suicide among female health professionals was about a quarter higher than the national average, largely driven by suicides among nurses, and it was uh, 0.42 times higher for primary and nursery school teachers, although lower than average for the teaching and education profession as a whole. The risk among male and female carers was almost twice the national average, but among corporate managers and, and directors, the risk was more than two-thirds lower for both sexes. The ONS said previous studies suggested an occupation may have a risk may have a high risk because of a low pay and job security and no access to or knowledge of methods of suicide. The Samaritan chief executive, Ruth Sutherland, said, We spend a third of our lives at work and one-fifth of us of, of us experience suicidal thoughts. So these resources are much needed. We shouldn't uh, stop there, though. It is up to us to create a culture in our workplaces where people feel safe enough to talk about their feelings and get support if they need it. PHE said the research, published on Friday, will help build a better understanding of factors that influence suicide and help identify 
where inequalities exist among different groups. The PHEX chief executive, Duncan Selby, said, People who die from suicide are usually not in contact with health services and often pushed push through in the silence as their ability to, to cope deteriorates. With more than two-thirds of adults in, un, in employment, the workplace offers an opportunity to reach people who need extra support. I urge all employers, large or small, public or private sector, to treat mental health as seriously as physical health. Early action can stop any employees reaching a desperate stage. Simple actions can make a huge difference. Talking with a manager or colleague can help people get, to, get the support they need and ultimately save lives. PHE, Business in the Community, and the Samaritans have published toolkits to help employers prevent and respond to suicides. The ONS limited its analysis to occupations where there were 50 suicides or more so that relative mortality rates could be estimated more precisely. <sighs> so Here before we, we go. go into the meat of this article, I just want to take a moment to... Uh, um, congratulate the writer on getting uh, basic math literacy right, and yep. uh, the way he used um, uh, he correctly used uh, phrases like uh, 2.6 times higher, um, and the lower lower uh, lower when talking about women, he says things like uh, 0.69 times higher than the national average. Yes, mm -hmm. that is how how. How these phrases should be used because you know 0.69% times higher means you know 1.69 times as high and 2.6 times higher means uh, 3.6 times as high. So yeah. this individual uh, is one of the is to use that correctly. Yeah, 0.69 is 69% and 2.6 is 360%. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, I did. You're much more nitpickier than me, but yeah, I, I didn't notice that it finally it has it uh, right. I usually, <laughs> I usually notice it when it's wrong. <laughs> uh, but yeah, uh, here, here, here we go again. Uh, this business, uh, I mean, I, I, I know it sounds a bit cynical, but I don't know how to phrase it otherwise. But this business of suicide is, uh, is much more murky than, uh, than probably anyone wants to think. Uh, I mean, tr trying to draw narratives from these kinds of numbers. Uh, uh, is as speculative as it can get, which is why I like that this article doesn't try to do that, uh, which is atypical for The Guardian, let's face it. Yeah, uh, that, that's also an article published more or less concurrently that, uh, um, that argues that suicide is, is all about um, all about class and uh, low income and so on. I, w I, w I was surprised that they didn't include that in this particular article too. <laughs> uh, because you know, if you take a very uh, rudimentary read, uh, rud rudimentary read of this uh, article, you can basically say, "Oh, so the, the very privileged, well-paid um, have a lower risk of suicide, and the un underprivileged, exploited ones, in the Marxist sense, uh, are, are at a much higher risk of suicide." Uh, which is true in the sense that there is a correlation, but is the causal link there? I don't think so. Um, maybe it's just that uh, the, there is a self-selection. People with much higher abilities to cope with stress because high-paying jobs tend to be far more stressful end up being in those high-paying high, high paying jobs, whereas those that have lower abilities to cope don't end up being in those high-paying jobs to begin with. Yeah. The, the, there's, there's many different possible explanations. Uh, and. And I mean, it, it's certainly certainly plausible that uh, having low income makes you more likely to commit suicide. It, it's not it's not un implausible at all that this might be a causal mechanism here, but we just don't know from from this data. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. Well, another interesting aspect that I, I, I was the first thing that I wanted to say when I wrote and when I read the, this article for the first time when you sent it to me. Um, Men in working in the construction industry and women employed in culture, media, and work. Okay, sport is an outlier, but culture, media, and healthcare and primary school teacher teaching are at the highest risk of suicide. What do these have in common? Uh, they. I mean, if you want to be a very smart leftist, I hope no leftist listens to this. But from this particular, uh, you can draw the. You you can draw the narrative that look. Uh, Tendentious, uh, predominantly single-sex professions carry a higher risk of suicide. 
because healthcare is uh, overwhelmingly dominated by women, primary school teaching, the same thing, media, obviously, culture, I, I guess they depend how, it depends how they define it, um, and well, construction industry is overwhelmingly dominated by men. Yeah, is media single sex though? I think it's, uh, isn't that more or less fairly balanced? Uh, if you look at, look, look at the um, at the BBC, which is the biggest media company uh, in Britain, and look at the, the the end of any show, and look at the, they usually put the credits and uh, look at the names of the people there. Uh, you rarely find more than a fifth man. I, I've been tra keeping track of, of this um, for about three months now because I'm trying to <clears throat> to see if the trends that I noticed in the Romanian media apply in other places too. And I've been keeping track particularly on Swedish media and Britain, Br British media, the f first and foremost on the state media. Um, <clears throat> it, it is much more female dominated than it would seem. Yeah, sure, in terms of talking heads, it's fairly balanced. But when you look behind the scenes, it's not so balanced as it used to be. Hmm, it's at it's not, interesting. At, at, least, at least not on BBC. I haven't checked on Channel 4 and other places. At least not yet. Uh, when I'm done checking, I'll obviously publish something. Uh, yeah, but that's I, something I've 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 never noticed before. Like, okay, may, maybe like uh, the various writers and so on, they might be more. Uh, but I, even then, I don't know. Like if if you look at um, uh, say, like if, if you look at, at Hollywood, for example, which of course not not, not Britain, but uh, um, definitely part of the media. Most of the writers, for example, there are men, and uh, yes. I mean. And camera but, operators, camera operators mostly men. Technical people mostly men. In uh, things like uh, like makeup, like uh, wardrobe, that sort of stuff. That's uh, I guess mostly female. But uh, I no, wouldn't it's fairly say that balanced it's... because of the high input of gay men. <laughs> 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 I mean, it, it, I'm half joking because it it it, it is it, it is a stereotype, but it's a stereotype. Uh, uh, very, very based on reality. That in makeup places, you and fashion and wardrobes and stuff like that, you will find a, a disproportionate amount of gay men. And there's nothing wrong with that, but just say. Yeah, I mean, I guess the, the types of people who who go on the in the credits in a BBC production, I don't know does that include like cameramen and uh, yes. technical yes. people, sound sound uh, people, and so on. Yes, that's why that's why I, I started the BBC with my evaluation. Now, mind you, I haven't finished my evaluation, so I'm you know don't take this as a uh, definite conclusion because I have I've just begun it. It is an endeavor that I suspect it will take me, considering how busy I am. I'll probably have the final conclusions at the end of this year uh, because I don't have enough time to actually uh, spend uh, eight hours a day. Uh, for several weeks to do it. I could finish it in, a in less than a month if I could only take care of this, but it's not the only project. Uh, but yeah, the, the reason I'm, uh, I started with the BBC is precisely because the BBC actually lists everyone, as opposed to private channels who either list nobody or they only list you know, the director of the transmission and things like that, and that's it. Uh, they, don't, uh, they don't include all the details. The BBC does. Uh, I guess they're legally ob obligated to do so, I don't know. Yeah, so it's it's really interesting if 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 it is actually just you know twenty percent, that would be quite surprising to me. It, it is usually a very female dominated, and I suspect it is because the uh, BBC having a, a much uh, more the BBC first of all first and foremost has its own active uh, anti-white and anti-male policies to employ uh, more women than men and more non-white people than white people. Uh, this is official. You can find them in their official documents. So I guess that these the, and this has been happening for over several years now at the BBC. So I wouldn't be surprised if that that had something to do with it, with the changing uh, of the demographics inside the BBC. That's one aspect. And the second aspect is that uh, when you have such a vast amount of funding, and the BBC has, and most private stations cannot afford to waste so much resources, you can actually buy. Uh, and make the studio environment and the production environment uh, easy enough that you don't find you don't encounter the the same the same struggles that uh, <clears throat> private stations uh, encounter. For example, 
in a in, in a private station the first and foremost uh, uh concern and i know this from experience because i've worked in private tv stations the biggest concern is to avoid re wasting resources so as a result you would usually have one or two people that are very well paid that they basically fill in the roles that in a state tv station are filled by six or seven people uh so and and those people tend to be men in a private station whereas in a public uh, tv station because those roles that are filled by only two people in a private station they're filled by six or seven people in the in a state broadcaster uh they're divided so well that uh it is a lot more likely to have women running for those roles too because they're they're usually smaller roles now obviously the pay decreases with that too but i guess that's um not an issue considering the fact that generally women tend to seek employment in state environment much more than men um, so i suspect this is one of the reason why uh things look uh, a bit more lopsided on state broadcasters and i've noticed the exact same phenomenon on the state broadcaster here in a in Romania too, and in uh, the the Polish st state broadcaster. Now, admittedly, in Poland and Romania, the the ratio is not 80 to 20; it's more like 65 to uh, 35. But nevertheless, it's uh, much more uh, disproportionate than it is in private stations, where it tends to be much more balanced. All right. Well, that was a long tangent. <laughs> <laughs> but we have we have plenty of time, of course. But, yeah. Uh, like one thing that sort of irked me about this article is, is the um, the first paragraph of the lead, which uh, mm -hmm. um, sort of established some sort of parity between uh, you know, men working in the construction industry and women employed in culture, media, etc. Um, reading that, a sort of casual reader reading that would uh, conclude from that probably that uh, um, these are the groups most at risk. So there's this one group, men in the work in the construction industry, and then women working in all sorts of different fields. A casual reader would probably conclude from that that uh, uh, there's a bigger problem here with suicide from women. Mm -hmm. But what, what, what they're actually trying to say is that uh, you know, among men, these are the most at-risk categories, and among women, these are the most at-risk categories. And you know, the most at-risk categories for women are still uh, you know, a, lot, a lot lower in the risk than the dangerous groups for men. Mm -hmm. But that, that that's you know sort of slightly misleading here in this article. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, you know, the Guardian being a bit misleading, shocking. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, but the the thing is that the more we learn about this, uh, this is what I uh, this is what my first takeaway from this article was. The more we learn about this, the more we realize how little we know about suicide. Uh, First and foremost, because it we, it wasn't studied for a very long period of time, just documented, and you know, and that's it. Uh, and second of it, because uh, for uh, quite some time it wasn't uh, just like with homelessness, it wasn't particularly um, fashionable to study it from a, uh, from a sex perspective. I mean, there there is there's still the meme going around from uh, I think it was an Australian, but it could be a British. Uh, newspaper where it said the one in four women are homeless and uh, you know the meme runs like oh and, and the other three are aliens <laughs> <laughs> uh, but, but the same thing goes with suicide for, for many years it wasn't I wouldn't say politically correct but definitely fashionable it wasn't fashionable to study it um, honestly at the very least because the, at the very least this article is just honest here are the facts make it uh, what you want uh, oh yes and we should urge employers to uh, treat mental health seriously, which is a fair uh, um, advice. I mean, at the very least, it doesn't start with the government should, because that's when I usually start running away from the... <laughs> if you start your argument with the government should, I'm like, yeah, maybe not. <laughs> because I, I'm not convinced that the government can do anything, uh, at least the, to directly influence the suicide rate. Uh, I don't think so. Yeah, it's it's quite hard. I mean, it, it's not like you can make it illegal. I mean, you can, but it's uh, it's not going to do anything. It was in Ireland until I think ninety one or ninety two. Yeah. So it is possible to make it illegal, but <laughs> I'm convinced that would help anyone. <laughs> That's for the death penalty on suicide. <laughs> yeah.
it just doesn't seem to work that way, that is a bit. Yeah. <sighs> All right, uh, let's go to the next one. Ah, the next one is very interesting. A uh, very short one. Oh, God damn it. Uh, coming from the Breitbart. The British government will instruct universities to defend freedom of speech. Uh, in a move that could have wide-reaching implications on United Kingdom campuses, British universities will be instructed to uphold freedom of speech as a legal duty. Joe Johnson, British Minister of State for Universities and Science, has written to universities informing them that they will be expected to uphold free speech for their students, faculty, and visiting guests. The move is being described as a response to the rise of safe spaces and other forms of censorship in higher education. According to Johnson, this means that the use of university's facilities cannot be, quote, denied to any individual or body on any grounds connected with their beliefs or views, policy or objective, close quote. As part of this, the government proposes to raise the issue of freedom of speech with a view to ensuring that a principle underscoring the importance of free speech in higher education is given due consideration, Johnson also wrote. He added that speech protections extend to premises occupied by student unions, even if those premises aren't university-owned. It is important to note that the duty extends to both the premises of the university and premises occupied by the students' unions, even when they are not part of the university premises. Johnson claimed that all institutions will be <clears throat> expected to have an explicit statement expressing their commitment to free speech principles. They are crucial in demonstrating to students that free speech should be at the heart of a higher education community. Johnson finished. Uh, just a short reminder for those who haven't listened to previous episodes. Uh, a month ago, in a spiked uh, uh, in a study commissioned by the Spiked magazine on free speech in uh, British campuses, uh, from a sample of 115 campuses studied, only seven had a, what the study called a hands-off approach to free speech. 35 have stifled or chilled free speech through various interventions, and the whooping 73 have banned and uh, actively censored ideas on campus. So. Uh, isn't it ironic that now the government has to come in and beg you to do what you were supposed to do? Yeah, I mean, but there's lots of things that are ironic uh, these days. <laughs> I mean, and, and not any government, but the government of Britain, which is known to be not particularly a friend of free, free speech. Yeah, that is also like if if the government of Astrobon tell tells us that uh, they're now in favor of free speech, I would be a bit uh, hesitant to believe them. And uh, I, I guess we have to wait and see what comes out of this. But uh, I'm I'm not throwing my hands up and uh, cheering yet because uh, I I don't really trust uh, trust this initiative. But mm -hmm. uh, maybe they'll um, surprise me positively. Yeah, in fairness, uh, it says that, oh, you have to uh, provide us with a strong letter uh, affirming your commitment to, yeah, we all know the effects of strongly worded letters, don't we? <laughs> the EU keeps on sending uh, strongly worded letters, so what's for the universities to just, you know, we're going to write the stupid strongly worded letter and then we'll continue to do yeah, well. it. We're totally in favor of free, free speech, but, you know, of course not hate speech, I mean. Yeah, or, 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 do, or pull some shenanigans like that and quote some various uh, policies or even laws that nobody even know they exist. Uh, I mean, this kind of thing have, has happened so many times in the past that, um, as you said, uh, we shouldn't be very hurried into throwing ourselves into the cheering crowd. Nevertheless, it it is uh, it is something that I, I have to admit I didn't expect from the Theresa May cabinet. Yeah. yeah. So there is hope after all. It, it, it is, uh, you know, 0.02% uh, increase in hope. Uh, it, it could last for as long as two days until we find out, and until we read the first letters submitted to the government. Uh, but nevertheless, uh, overall, it, it, it could be just a, a blip on the radar or it could be the beginning of something uh, quite okay. I mean, I don't expect the government to just uh, come in and start punishing universities who don't abide by I don't think that will happen anytime soon. Uh, but if you get some pressure from the Ministry of National Education that, hey, you shouldn't actually censor that individual because you don't like 
<clears throat> his views on trannies or his views on uh, the religion of special needs or whatever. If that happens at least once, that would be fantastic. There would be in and of itself an immense amount of project of, of progress. Yeah. All right. Let's go to the next one. Okay, next one is from Zaid. Until today, women have worked for nothing. On equal payday, today, the 18th of March for this year, women all over Germany remind us that the current difference in pay between the sexes is 21%. That means that women work 77 days per year for no pay. This figure is a raw gender pay gap. That means that the hourly wage of working women are compared to the hourly wages of working men. According to the Federal Office for Statistics, the raw gender pay gap is calculated for all so-called uh, NACE groups, with the exception of agriculture, fishing, the government sector, private households, and extraterritorial organizations in firms of at least 10 employees. All male and female employees are contained therein. And if you're wondering what this last sentence means, uh, I have no idea. It also doesn't make any sense in German. <laughs> All yeah, the employees are contained therein. I mean, we, we just read the list of receptions of, of employees are not uh, contained therein. I don't know. I know what that's so, so everyone to else except those listed there. Also, what, what is an extraterritorial organization? Uh, an organization that's outside the territory of Germany. But uh, okay, so I like don't know, embassies? May, maybe something like that, uh, embassies, something like maybe. Or maybe know. a factory by BMW in Czechia or whatever, something like that. Yeah, I, I, don't, I don't know exactly know what, what exactly that, that means. Okay, fair enough. Also that uh, NACE is some sort of EU um, um, uh, abbreviation that's uh, some some sort of French abbreviation. I don't actually, I don't remember what, what it actually says, but it's just like a different uh, occupational groups. Uh. Okay, let's consider, continue with the article. Okay. If we consider only men and women in the same position with the same qualifications and the same amount of experience, there is still a difference of 6% according to the latest data. That is 1% less than the previous year, but still an inexplicable difference that is obviously due to sex. This is why activists are using equal payday as an opportunity for demonstrations and discussions to spread awareness about the gap and its causes. 2017 marks the 10th anniversary of the equal payday in Germany. Women in many countries across the world are participating in this event, although it falls on a different day in each country. By the way, Germany isn't doing well here compared to the rest of the EU, as the gap between men and women is markedly smaller in many other European countries. The German version of Equal Pay Day was initiated by Henrike von Blaten, an entrepreneur and a former president of Business Women Germany from 2010 to 2016. She and her comrades in arms managed to recruit important supporters from politics, business and academia for the cause. Here, some of these women talk about what, ha what has to change so that in the future, they will be able to celebrate Equal Pay Day on the 1st of January. And then the, the um, various contributions from these um, uh, distinguished women I have left out because it's just... <laughs> it's just more of the, of the same talking points. So that there's just one amusing thing that this, uh, uh, that this founder of, of, of the Equal Pay Day believes that uh, you know, with the right policies we can... Uh, um, we, we can uh, we can we can eliminate the the pay gap by 2020, uh, <laughs> which is just uh, that just goes to show how what a serious thinker she is. Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, by the way, I found out what NEET is. Uh, it stands for Nomenclature Statistique des Activités Économiques dans la Communauté Européenne or the Statistical Classification of Economic Activities in the European Community. Uh, I don't know if that helps. <laughs> 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 it probably makes things makes that phrase even more complicated than it already was. <laughs> yeah, it's also really weird because they don't explain what this acronym means at all. <laughs> It's it's just really it's just a really poorly poorly written article. Yeah, uh, so so yeah, they basically it, it, it's basically uh, what it is is uh, 
uh, and I had no idea that this exists at the EU level too, uh, but I'm not surprised it exists. I mean, if it's legislation, they obviously created more. Uh, it, basically, every country has uh, a huge uh, dossier in which every single occupation that is recognized by the state has a particular code. Uh, so this basically is a dossier for the entire European Union. Um, so as to no longer have compati I suppose this is the reason to no longer have compatibility issues. For instance, let's say, um, <clears throat> I don't know, a hairdresser. A hairdresser might have the statistical, uh, the sorry, the uh, uh, wor the workplace code. To, I don't know, 103 in Romania, but 5,300 in Germany. So instead of uh, competing with all these different codes by different country, we all refer to the unique code offered in the. Um, in the statistical glossary by uh, the European Union, I, I presume this is the this is the reason why it exists. I had no idea that people were actually using it, uh, but then, but then again, you learn everything. Uh, according to the portal of the European Commission, it's been used since 1970. Okay, fair enough. Uh, although I still think, I mean, it's a four-digit classification providing framework. There are more than 9,999 uh, <laughs> professions out there. As yeah. for the equal pay day, uh, don't they provide any comparison on when it is celebrated, quote-unquote celebrated, in other places? Because, you know, cele uh, because celebrating it on March 22nd or whenever this article was published, 18th. Uh, uh, 18th. Um, it, it, it is quite well. I mean, uh, in Italy, you would get to celebrate it somewhere in August uh, on certain professions at the very least. And, uh, and in some particular professions, such as construction work, uh, the gender pay gap being minus 69%. That is to say, women earn 69% on average more than men. Uh, and I, I think that's fine. I mean, it, it, it is only feminists who seem to think that this is a problem. Well, obviously, they don't think it's a problem when women earn more, um, but I don't think it's a problem this anyway. Is more equality. Yeah, it's it's more equality. It's double plus good progress. Uh, <laughs> whereas I think it's it's not a problem. It's okay that if the market in Italy is in such a way that in certain professions the quote unquote gender pay gap is minus sixty nine percent, so fucking what? Uh, that that is their market. The exact same sector has a gender pay gap of plus thirty percent in Slovakia. That's fine too. Why should there be a problem with this? Yeah, but the, I mean, uh, tide is considered uh, is is considered by most people to be one of the most sort of high quality newspapers in in Germany. Um, <laughs> That's not helping. <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, still, they produced this piece of shit article. Um, you know, I, I really like this uh, this particular um, sentence here, um, talking about the um, pay gap after um, after controlling for qualifications, the amount of experience, and uh, the same position, um, and it's still six percent, and um, that is still an inexplicable difference. That is obviously due to sex, because I mean we've, we've taken into account four different explanations. And obviously there can't be any more anymore because I mean, uh, we more than four explanations. We were, and besides, that would be absurd. Let's we're taking, we're taking ahead. three explanations into account. So obviously, it must be the fourth one. Yeah, that's or, of logic. Or, or it could be all four of them plus another four that they didn't think about. <laughs> yeah, uh, because you know uh, it is it is inexplicable difference that it's obviously due to sex. Let's assume that's true. Uh, Again, so what? Uh, you know, sex is a difference. Uh, men and women are not completely irreplaceable, and that's fine. Why is that a problem? This is the portion that I never understood from progressive leftism. Uh, why is this a problem? We're not re identical and easy to replace one to one another. There is some uniqueness there and some differences that are due to uh, one sex. So what? It's not. A, it is a problem when the state mandates it, but when it happens naturally as a result of individual uh, individuals being free to make their own choices, that should be celebrated. Vive la différence, as the French used to say. Used to say because not anymore. That's forbidden to say that now. What? 
Uh, but in all, in all seriousness, why is this a problem? I've never been able to understand this. Yeah, there's this, this is huge irrational fear of discrimination. Um, even though, of course, we discriminate uh, even based on sex and all sorts of uh, of um, of situations. We discriminate based on sex, for example, in uh, forming romantic relationships. Like yes. ninety-seven percent or so of the population prefer a partner of the opposite sex. That's that's uh, I guess that's sexism. That's uh, discriminating based on sex in a very important manner. Oh, one hundred percent of the population, well, except for the bisexuals, which are zero point zero two percent. But all the other uh, part no, of the human population of, uh, uh, prefer someone of the opposite sex. Yes, but then, uh, but then again, gays prefer someone uh, of of the same sex, so they discriminate yeah. against the <laughs> they discriminate against the opposite sex. So fucking what? Yeah, I mean, for, Christopher for, for, Hitchens for, used to say that discrimination is a sign of uh, uh, of being in a, in full, in one's full mental faculties. Uh, basically, it is perfectly sane to discriminate, and being completely anti-discrimination is insane. Yeah, if 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 you're not discriminating, you're basically you're basically a plant or something like that. I mean, I mean, if, even even plants act even plants in some sort of way that they they for example they they want to preserve water. I mean, they want in uh, scare quotes uh, discriminate between. Uh, Water that is inside them and water that is outside them, and they want want water inside them, if if they're lacking water, for example, um, yeah. But it, basically, any sort of action you take uh, is discrimination. If you um, decide to eat a sandwich, and we discriminate between sandwich and uh, and sand and uh, rocks and uh, dirt and uh, clothing and all sorts of other things you could eat conceivably. Um, <laughs> You're also discriminating you know, whether you want to eat it or whether you want to and uh, put it on your head or uh, uh, rub it on your on your face or uh, uh, put it in some other orifice. <laughs> you do all of these things in the sandwich, but uh, instead you discriminate and de decide to eat it instead of um, doing other things with it. <laughs> Basically, any sort of action you take is, is discriminatory. Consider the horrible discrimination against soups that happens whenever you pick up a sandwich. Mm -hmm. <laughs> CYR, uh, CYR asks in the chat room, when do we get the equal work day? Uh, that's a good question, and I think it would be celebrated, you know, the equal work day for 2017, it will be celebrated somewhere in April 2018, and then the <laughs> equal work day for 2018, it will be celebrated in March 2019 and so on and so forth. Because the fact of the matter is that um, the sexes do work differently on average. And not only differently, but also uh, uh, differently in terms of quality, but also in terms of quantity. Uh, in many countries, women overall, by averages, tend to work less than men. And that's fine. It is a free choice. At least it's, uh, then, it's then to complain right? about the uh, the differences in pay is stupid. At least if you're talking about um, about employment, if you're talking yes. about work in general, yes. it's uh, it's roughly roughly the same between the sexes. True. Absolutely true. In terms of hours hours work at least. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely true. But uh, in terms of this is a discussion about employment, about paid work. Um, well, actually, I should say paid paid work, not necessarily employment, because presumably they also include. Uh, various forms of entrepreneurs and self-employed people who don't actually can. You Not only really... this statistic, they they also oh, only no, include no. Um, firms with at least ten employees. So oh, it's okay. just about employees. Also, now not any government employees. So it's uh, it, it it's not it's not a um, picture of the whole economy. It's just this particular group that they're focusing on, which is quite large still, but uh, it's it's not the whole thing. Yeah, it's not the whole. And once you include, once you exclude state workers, uh, <clears throat> it gives you a, a good perspective of how things look in the real world when, uh, when there are no leg ups because you have the correct sex or the correct skin color or the correct diversity points. I guess, uh, although in large corporations these things sometimes do happen, but nevertheless they affect the economy much less than uh, than when the state does it. Uh, but still, I mean, <laughs> it, it 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 is. And I don't know how how will this be, uh, because it it, it is an amusing in a way, and also uh, 
<clears throat> surprising to me to see how many uh, <clears throat> individuals who should know better fall for this. Because I can understand when SJWs and Marxists from public universities who've never worked a single day in a private sector and have no bloody clue how the economy works, I can understand, even though they're wrong, I can understand how and why they might end up thinking like that. They don't know better. I mean, let's put it this way. Uh, they could know better, but they don't. But with people who have actually been in, the, in business and they should know better, it is astonishing to me how they still, they still take the bait for this crap. Yeah, it's, it's all, so it is a bit surprising to me that this uh, group is uh, led by an entrepreneur. I mean... Yeah, that, that's why I'm asking this. It would be interesting to see if uh, if she pays her employees, uh, uh, if she pays her um, male and female employees the same on average. I would I suspect I not, but she uh, she doesn't. Yeah, I don't know. Uh, so far, every single um, quote unquote activist for this kind of nonsense that was in a position to pay people um, for various reasons, whether it was for um, a political campaign in the case of Hillary Clinton or in the case of uh, um, other individuals who founded their own media companies or whatever. Every single time they ended up uh, doing the exact same thing that they accuse those evil sexist capitalists of doing, which, uh, which is to say that when you, when you draw the line at the end of the day, you'll still end up with the very similar uh, statistical differences uh, that you get to see in the general economy. Maybe, just maybe, it's not the capitalists. Yeah, I mean, I guess, guess it, it is capitalism at work, but there's nothing wrong with that. It's, it's just people being uh, being paid commensurately with the work they do. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And CYR says in the chat room, I've never seen any act, any uh, seen it where activist organizations actually have equal pay. Yeah, they don't. Uh, I remember when uh, back in the days when uh, um, when there was the uh, uh, the equal pay message uh, broadcasted by Hillary Clinton, and then you know some media people looked into how her staff is being paid, and uh, surprise, surprise, it had the gender pay gap very similar to the. Uh, general median uh, of the American economy. Uh, not shocking at all. It, it was only shocking for the true believers. <laughs> uh, but for everyone else, it was like, yeah, that's you know, normal. <laughs> I, I, I'm convinced that the same thing stay, is true in the SPLC and the and probably in the companies of these uh, individuals, uh, female entrepreneurs who started this whole crap. I, I would be very surprised if that's not the case. And if that's not the case, I would be very curious to see what did they do to, in, order, in order for it to no longer be the case. And then, of course, I would ask um, to, to hear about, again about their company 20 years from now using the same policies. Because whatever they did, I'm not convinced that would be sustainable over the long run. Yep. It can only be sustainable, and uh, and uh, single sex employment is not particularly sustainable either. If you remember, around two years ago, we we read the story of a feminist who, uh, who eventually turned anti-feminist, who uh, quit her job and uh, founded her own company, uh, media company. She said, "No, I'm going to employ only women uh, to stay away from the male gaze and stay away from the patriarchy and whatnot, uh, because women are best and men suck and blah yada yada yada." Uh, her company went bankrupt in flames, uh, and it was not sustainable at all. Uh, but you know, when she was writing down her observations, it was like you know, I, I considered everyone to be an entire bigot when they said, "Look, they, they, it just doesn't work like that. If you have an office full of women, you're going to have these particular sets of problems that they're just going to happen, regardless of how smart and woke and uh, progressive you may think those women are." And you know, she was like, you know, I, I scoffed at everyone. I thought I'm, I'm the, the smartest, the, the specialist snowflake that ever snowflaked. And uh, everyone else is a bigot. And at the end of the day, she had to concede that after wasting her own money and putting her money where her, her mouth was, I was like, yeah, no, everyone else is right. I was wrong. Yeah, I, I, I actually, I, I think that uh, you know, single-sex employment can work quite well as long as it's just men. <laughs> yeah, it tends to work better. When there, you... there are several industries where it's basically only men, and that seems to work. But uh, if it's Oil only women, that, 
that uh, seems to work really poorly. It, it can work uh, quite fine if it's uh, almost only women, if, if there's you know, a few men in there. And uh, mm -hmm. often it's uh, um, with, these, with many of these men in uh, the higher positions, Yes. That 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 seems to work, but uh, if it's just only women, that uh, just doesn't seem to work. It's very rarely the case, and when it happens and it works, it's usually a small company with five or six, maybe ten employees. Uh, once you get higher than that, it just doesn't seem to work when it's only women. And you know the the, the few exceptions that do exist, they tend to be. You know, we used to say here that. The exception that just confirms the rule. Yeah, I, I guess it's also just a a, a question of uh, of of individual women that just uh, happen to get along well. Mm -hmm. um, and that's fine, but uh, just more more often than not, it's something that doesn't work too well. Mm -hmm. And it, it, generally, workplaces tend to work better if, if it's uh, something like like balance if, if, if it's not just one sex entirely over the other and if you if you have to have a unisex uh, um, work environment it's better be only men because the other thing that it can work but it usually doesn't yeah and I'm not particularly surprised by this I mean there are there is such thing as evolutionary tendencies and men at the end of the day did evolve to uh, cooperate with each other when there is a task to uh, uh, acquire, but very little anywhere else. That's why you see men cooperating very poorly in things like um, uh, charities or social activism and things like that, but very well when it comes to uh, let's build a, a bu let, let's build a building or let's, uh, I don't know, things like that. Let's build this car or whatnot. Uh, it just seems to happen and it happens all over and over and over again in, in every single instance. And uh, trying not to notice this in order to avoid offending someone is seems like uh, how they call it in English a fool's errand. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Uh, let's go to the next one. The next one is about my hometown. Um, <clears throat> coming from Actual de Cluj, the misogynist city of Cluj Naboga. New streets are named after known humanists, but only men. New streets appeared in Cluj-Napoca and they're named after reputable humanists, but just like in the last quarter of the century, with trivial exceptions, none of the new streets are named after women. The local literary critic Petu Puante died in 2013 and this year the city council is considering attributing his name to a street in Cluj-Napoca. The proposal is part of a, list of, uh, that, uh, of a list that counts eight slots, all of them known humanists, and, the list, and then the author lists uh, all eight of them. The most likely to be known by this audience is uh, Richard Wurmbrandt, a Christian minister and an anti-communist dissident who was imprisoned during the Gulag era and then ran to the United States. Anyway, he lists uh, all of those eight. Those names, uh, these names are to be given to new streets uh, in the Quinto Valley and Zoilo neighborhood. Uh, we studied all the streets' names in the city. At the end of last year, the list had uh, 1,213 elements to which we added the ones analyzed today. We did this to see how many of these uh, are named after women, and then he lists all of them. In total, 14 slots out of over 1,200. As a comparison, the streets named after men are almost 500. Uh, Actual de Cluj, our publication, spoke about this problem before in the summer of 2015. What changed in the meantime? The total number of streets grew by 38, but not the total number of streets named after women. Now, I would have said that this is a very good opportunity for the author to note that the majority of the streets in this city are not named after people. We, know we had this conversation before. Um, in the case of this city, a bit over 700 though, out of the uh, 1,221 streets in total are named after events, places, flowers, animals, and objects. Uh, for instance, I worked for a while at a place located on the Paris Street, and two years ago, some friends did some charity work for a but, family but, but, li living but, but, on. You know, but uh, Paris is actually a men's name from uh, Greek mythology, so 
Exactly. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> Fair enough. And you know, I was saying that two years ago, some friends did some charity work for a family living on the train station street. And I guess since trains are invented by men, therefore it's a. It, <laughs> yeah, yeah, makes perfect sense. Uh, yeah, uh, you know, it, it, in my experience, this is the case in most cities uh, in Europe, and. Most people don't seem to care about these things, and if anything, most people seem to prefer streets not named after people, because sometimes people have or have had in the past names that are difficult to spell, uh, especially when you choose uh, foreign uh, individuals. I mean, think about it this way, the George Washington Boulevard in... Uh, um, I don't know, uh, Podgorica, Mon Montenegro. It might be difficult for the locals to spell George Washington. Uh, or uh, more recently, Donald J. Trump Boulevard in Tirana in Albania. Uh, this, just, this just happened a few days ago. Uh, <laughs> not joking. <laughs> Still funny. <laughs> and, you know, the, the mayor or the leader of opposition, whatever, said, oh, it's better to be called by, named after Trump than by those uh, communist criminals. It was a very, very funny piece of news. Uh, <laughs> but, but nevertheless, I mean, okay, Trump is not complicated to spell, but uh, sometimes you might is, you might end up with names that are very difficult to spell. So as a result, many people tend to prefer uh, streets named after e e events or uh, or things that are easy to spell. I mean, you know, for instance, the, the Tiger Street uh, or things like that, the Train Station Street. Uh, which makes a little bit more sense. But I don't understand this, why there are people who care about this so much. Yeah, I... <laughs> Sorry, I have nothing. <laughs> <laughs> I have no idea why someone would care that deeply about street names of all things. Yeah, and not only this author cares about it, but you know, when he was flooded with comments explaining to him why it's not really such an issue or whatnot, um, he deleted all the comments and closed the comment session. Uh, and so, <laughs> I'm not surprised. I'm not surprised at all. Uh, the, this is a certified moron. Uh, <laughs> uh, but then, nevertheless, you know, he prides himself to be a qualified journalist. And you know, from a uh, resume point of view, I guess he has a point. But uh, <laughs> from an output point of view, not really. <laughs> Uh, yeah, anyway, from the very silly place. Speaking of the silly place, holy shit. <laughs> <laughs> this is from the very silly place. Uh, and traveling that, oh, go ahead. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah, you, you, this was, yeah. Sorry, yeah, sorry. yeah. Go ahead. Traveling all the way to Spain. Uh, the article is from the Express, but it's about Spain, or actually Catalonia. Uh, coming from the Express, Europe's first sex robot, Brothel, forced out of base as prostitutes complain of competition. <laughs> I'm going to need extra effort to read this. Um, Europe's first sex robot, Brothel, has been forced to move after real-life prostitutes complained sex dolls were stealing their trade. The original location in Barcelona at 2 Beixada at the San Miguel uh, had uh, been in the Spanish city's Gothic quarter, north of the cathedral. But the Brothel, not far from the La Rambla in the heart of the city, has now moved to a mystery new location with a receptionist saying the address would only be given out to paying customers. Prostitutes who work in the city with APROSEX, which is the Association of Sex Professionals, objected, saying a doll cannot match the services of a real person and denigrates real sex workers to merely being an object. A statement on their website read, quote, The sex aff affection of a person cannot be provided by a doll. They are different and they are different and compatible services. They do not communicate. They do not listen to you or, or caress you. They do not comfort you or look at you. They do not give you their opinion or drink a glass of champagne with you. Close quote. I guess that's a feature. Um, Janet, a prostitute with over 30 years in the industry who works in the city's Rafal district, said, quote, it is another strategy of the patriarchy that presents us as object without rights or soul, a privilege of the wealthy classes. She added the initiative was, quote, a fetish for many men and women who wish to return to a childhood lacking in affection. 
Municipal police in the Catalonian capital has la also launched an investigation into the legality of the brothel, which offered clients sex with realistic state-of-the-art polymer sex dolls after it opened last month. However, when the authorities tried to carry out a routine inspection, they discovered that the business had since moved out of the premises. The owner of the venue claimed uh, they were not aware of what the property was being used for and only became aware of its use when they recognized the walls from photographs published on the internet. The owner has since cancelled the tenancy agreement with the Lumi Dolls entrepreneurs. When contacted, the brothel's receptionist said she could not give out much information, but said that the business was still operating. She said, we are simply moving to another place. Lumidols, a pun on the Spanish slang term for prostitute, is uh, believed to be the first such brothel to open in Europe after similar venues uh, in places like Japan and China were hugely popular. The brothel offered the services of four uh, lifelike dolls, which cost around 5,000 euros to produce and are made in the United States and made out of thermoplastic elastomer, charging uh, punters around 120 euros for two hours. Each one is unique and made to order, although they measure between 1.6 and 1.7 meters tall and weigh 40 kilos. The brothel's website claims these are totally realistic dolls, both in the movement of their joints and, uh, uh, sorry, in the joints to the touch of their skin that will allow you to fulfill all your fantasies, close quote. And it adds, quote, these sex dolls will make the experience more pleasurable, exciting, and erotic, close quote. <laughs> So the <laughs> the hookers are <laughs> are pissed off at the competition. So the sexual trade union organized itself <laughs> to drive the competition away. <laughs> Seriously. <laughs> now I I knew I knew that Spain was a very syndicalist country, but come on, <laughs> please. <laughs> The particularly interesting portion is this one. Uh, Janet, a prostitute with over 30 years in the industry who works <laughs> in the, the whatever district, uh, lectures us about why we shouldn't be using uh, sex dolls. Now, look, I'm not a big sex doll fan. So in fact, I think it's a very degenerate behavior. But if I had to choose between the prostitute with over 30 years in the industry and the sex doll, I don't think it would be such a difficult choice. <laughs> uh, I'm sorry if that sounds a bit um, mean, but seriously, uh, you know, there is such thing as retirement, you know, <laughs> just yeah. saying. <laughs> yeah, and also those, uh, those sex dolls don't uh, uh, give you their opinion uh, because you certainly would want to get the, the opinion from a 50-year-old uh, uh, feminist prostitutes. That's that's obviously the reason you're coming to a problem. <laughs> yeah, I was saying. I mean, they don't give you their opinion, and they, they, and I'm like, that's feature, not bug. Yeah. <laughs> James, do you have anything to say about this? <laughs> Let's assume he does. <laughs> Still, I, I, I'm trying to tr treat this seriously, but I, I just can't. I mean, <laughs> um, as for, you know, it's, it's another strategy of the patriarchy that presents us as objects without rights or soul. Uh, I'm sorry, no. uh, uh, <laughs> but, you know, first, first of all, the biggest opponents to prostitution legalization today is the feminist left. It, it, it just is why, especially in Spain, that's 100% true, and it's true in most of Europe. Uh, it's true in Sweden, it's true in Norway. The biggest opposition to prostitution legalization in most places in Europe uh, is the feminist left. It's not the patriarchy, it's not the... Uh, uh, sure, you can say that the, the feminist left regards you as objects without rights or soul, that's definitely true. Uh, you know, you, you have the causes correct, but you don't have the perpetrator correct. The, the perpetrator in this case, it's, it's not the patriarchy. Yeah, and it it it, it does not represent uh, or present uh, actual women as objects without rights or souls. It presents 
objects without rights or souls as objects without rights or souls. Yeah. <laughs> a sex doll is not a woman. Yeah. It, it's interesting to me that um, you would expect the users of such services to be a bit confused of what, about what's real and what's not and to be having weird fetishes and whatnot. But it seems to me that the, uh, the feminists are the ones who... Uh, who are confused about what's real and what's not because they don't seem to realize that you know it, it, it's a fucking doll. It's not a human. It's not a woman. It's not. It's not something with rights or souls or privileges or anything. It's a thing like a pen, like a lighter, like a pack of cigarettes. It doesn't have rights. Yeah, we, we might just as well uh, complain about uh, um, women who use vibrators and dildos. Uh, um, representing men as uh, nothing but uh, uh, disembodied, uh, soulless penises uh, used solely for their pleasure. Yeah. And that would be an equally valid complaint, which is to say not, not valid at all. <laughs> yeah, yeah it, 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 it would be for sure just as dumb. Uh, and besides, these kinds of things have been around. I mean, you know, the, uh, what, what, I, I don't know the, uh, the English term. I know that no. Don't ask me why I know the Norwegian term, but not the English. But basically, uh, um, flashlight pussy. I think it's the term in English. Uh, it's a flashlight, yes. Yeah, flashlight with an with an e. Uh, okay, okay, fair enough. Uh, that kind of thing has been around since forever, and uh, you know, this is basically a glorified flashlight pussy. <laughs> uh, and uh, Presumably, they also have sex dolls uh, with men uh, to be used by women. And if they don't, they probably will have uh, uh, quite soon. And they, those ones would be glorified dildos. Uh, so what? I mean, uh, I don't like it. I wouldn't want to use them. But to drive them out of business because you don't like them? Eh, that's a step too far. Yeah, at the end of the day, uh, this, no one is being hurt here. Yeah. No, no one, no one's rights are being infringed in any way. Uh, all of this is, I guess, competition. But then you might just as well complain about a uh, regular brother um, opening its doors. It's yeah. just as much competition. Yeah. Yeah, but you see the. And, and uh, in fact, it's even more competition because it's the closest substitute. <laughs> Fair enough. Uh, but I guess they wouldn't object to that that much because in order for an, another brothel to be opened, uh, that brothel would have to also be member of the Association of Sex Professionals. So it would be still regulated by them. So it wouldn't be much of a competition to begin with. You have to understand in Spain, hookers are unionized. <laughs> okay, so this is basically like the uh, uh, the Uber version of prostitution in, uh, yeah. in Spain. <laughs> Uber like hooker. <laughs> That sounds like a good business idea. <laughs> <laughs> Uber hooker. Uh, or the Airbnb of hookers. Well, actually, that exists already. But <laughs> <laughs> you didn't learn that from here. Don't, don't Google it. Don't. Of course, you're going to Google it. Um, <laughs> but <laughs> um, but no, seriously, uh, the, uh, the arguments presented for it are just... Uh, th they sound like the... Uh, like something from the 19th century or something. Uh, uh, you know, the uh, car is very much dangerous and it cannot fulfill the uh, the same greatness that uh, a, a horse carriage can offer. Uh, and you know, everyone in life, everyone else is like, yeah, maybe not. Uh, or you know, some someone in the 70s, oh, sorry, not in the 70s, in the 90s, uh, being opposed to the emergence of the iPod because the uh, records are just better. You're carrying hundreds of kilos of records every time you move away, it's just better. Uh, it just sounds like a, an, op an opposition to technology per se, not <clears throat> not any sort of uh, um, of a more coherent argument. I, I, I'm ready to hear arguments of on how this could be psychologically harmful. Maybe it is. Maybe it isn't. I'm open to such arguments, not with the view to ban them, but with the view to expand my knowledge. But this kind of thing, uh, well, we don't want them here because patriarchy and because it's a fetish. Yeah, so what? Uh, there are many things fetish. <laughs> you know, just <laughs> stand in line. There's a long queue of fetishes and it, it, just another one was added. Uh, yeah, so. Yeah, and I mean, the, the, I guess this is going to come up uh, more and more in the future because yeah, sure. I mean, 
right now, I mean, they, they talk about how these uh, dolls are so lifelike and realistic and so on, but they're really not. Uh, but I mean, these dolls are going to become better and better, and uh, maybe, it's, or actually, quite likely, someday they will be um, as as realistic as, uh, or, 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 or at least very close to uh, um, having sex with an actual person. Yeah. And at, at this point, I guess prostitutes are going to be, to uh, face some very serious competition there. Yeah. Um, so I guess from from that angle, it's sort of understandable why they're worried, but uh, it that doesn't mean they have any sort of right to uh, to stop this technology. Just like uh, um, I know horse breeders and buggy makers didn't have the right to stop the automobile from spreading, and the candle makers had no right to stop electric lighting. Um, these kinds of new technologies might be bad for some particular group, but on the whole for society, they're usually uh, quite beneficial and uh, I mean- Or at it, the very least neutral. Yeah, I mean, in a, in a case like this, you can uh, debate the morality of uh, using a um, sex doll uh, with, you, you might call it a generator as you, as you did, but uh, uh, so you, you, you could say that it's, it's not good to use these technologies. Um, but at the end of the day, every person has to decide, has to decide that for themselves. For sure. And, yeah. Uh, yeah, I mean, if, if, again, if lots of people adopt these uh, technologies, then uh, it, it would be disingenuous to, to say that they're all wrong, that they all um, made, um, made a mistake in their evaluation, and therefore they must all be forced to not use these, uh, these dolls. Because, no, if I would you, still say if, they are, they're all wrong, but nevertheless, they should be allowed to be wrong. The, the, that's the essence of freedom, to be allowed to be wrong. Yeah, I mean, even, even if you um, ban this sort of thing, it's, uh, you're not going to be able to prevent it. Oh, for sure, for sure, for sure. Uh, I, I, would, I would go as far as to say that if a significant chunk of the populace adopts these kinds of technologies, especially once they get much better than they are now, uh, this is a huge win for top-tier hookers who will now face much less competition and they could charge a lot more and, uh, and become a luxury once again. They make prostitution great again. Uh, but I presume this particular prostitute, Janet, is not one of the top tier ones, uh, which kind of makes sense since she's 60 ish. <laughs> I really understand this argument. How, how, how would it help um, a high tier prostitute? Well, think about it this way if uh, a significant chunk of the market no longer goes, no longer uh, wants to buy uh, prostitution services uh, because it's content with the services, quote unquote, services offered by the sex dolls. Uh, then those who still do want uh, will, will have to spend a lot more to actually acquire it, because you know it, it, it is a supply and demand. You'll have a, a, it, it will become something. Uh, think about it this way: when you want to buy a vinyl today, it's much more expensive than it than it was 30 years ago because it's now. Yeah, yeah, but, but but that's because you no longer have the um, the economies of scale for. Of, yeah. for, for producing these things, and but you don't really have economies of scale in prostitution. I mean, there's just very little of that. Well, you do because uh, there's well, there will be far fewer organized brothels. It will be more of a personalized service uh, for the very few clients still left uh, to demand that particular service, as opposed to the more uh, streamlined service offered by the the um, the sex dolls. But I mean, there's a basic supply and demand. Is uh, if 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 uh, if you have uh, more more supply of uh, um, sex store services that are a substitute uh, to some degree for uh, prostitution, um, and you don't, uh, that would surely put downward pressure on. Uh, on prices for for prostitutes rather than upward pressure. I don't kind of understand where your argument comes from. Yeah, it would put at first uh, uh, downward pressure on prostitutes' uh, prices for sure. Uh, but that's on the on the short run. Over the long run, especially as the sex dolls are getting better and better and better, uh, at one point it will become uh, not lucrative enough for most hookers to still stay in the business, and they will go out of business. 
Uh, and the very top tier ones that will remain in business, they will have to adapt to a, a, a different business model, such as personalized services at the client's home or things like that, that would make them a premium service as opposed to... Yep, but uh, the investors can already do that today. Yeah, they, they, they can do that today, but they, have a, they face a lot more competition uh, now than they would face uh, after uh, most of their competition, their human competition would have been priced out of the market by the, by the robots. I, I don't really see this argument. I mean, in this uh, hypothetical future world, you have, uh, um, you, you have the um, sex bots that are uh, basically equivalent to uh, um, basic cookers today, and you have the um, elite prostitutes that, uh, that, that uh, charge you know, more for, for, more, um, for, for, for higher quality um, uh, services. I don't really see why. What why, I'm saying why? is that the, the the very high quality of them would the chart would be able to charge even more, and the all the all the other ones will be will be charging zero because they will be out of business. Uh, <clears throat> let me give you a, a parallel. Maybe I can make myself understood that way. Um, in the 1920s, uh, a significant chunk of the uh, of people they would still make their clothes uh, at home. As a result, there was a certain price. Let's put it some orientative price. Uh, uh, for a shirt, you would spend uh, the, in the equivalent today of, uh, let's say, 100 euros. As time went on and a very streamlined, very efficient way of producing clothes got very, very normative and mainstream everywhere, uh, the overall price of clothes did go uh, down and uh, most people uh, did no longer buy from the... Uh, from the very from from the craftsmen that would make clothes uh, because those craftsmen would still charge around 100 euros per a shirt and they could get the same thing out of from a factory for like five euros um, and then they went to China and it costed one euro <laughs> and then there's that um, but uh, and as a result most of the previous craftsmen went out of business but the very top tier of them that re did remain reoriented themselves towards making uh, cr to, towards craftsmanship of very traditional clothes and now they sell one item for like 1000 euros whereas uh, um, 80 or 90 years ago they would have sold the exact same item for the equivalent of 100 euros because there are few very few of them left very few craftsmen of that particular thing that used to be very normative uh, everywhere and now it's very rare and it's basically a premium thing I guess, but I mean, uh, premium shirts existed, you know, 100 years ago too, or 200 years ago, mm -hmm. um, just like premium yeah, prostitution what, what, exists today. Fair enough, fair enough. But what was premium? Of, okay, the example with clothing is not particularly uh, great <clears throat> because what was premium then is not no longer premium now, and what was pretty much common uh, 100 years ago, especially in rural areas, now it's considered premium and uh, you can you can make very good money if you can uh, <clears throat> if you can make clothing as the peasants used to do it 100 or 150 years ago. You can make very good okay. money, uh, which wasn't simply wasn't the case. If you knew the, if you if you are a very good craftsman of clothes uh, right now and you make very good money, and if you could go back in time, you would probably starve to death or barely survive because the exact same craftsmanship was shared by most people. Uh, mm -hmm. So it would it wouldn't be such a big deal. Yeah, I, I guess it works with clothing, but I don't really see how how that would transfer to prostitution because I mean it's, it's not like uh, um, yeah because it's not like you need training to get into the business. Yeah, it's it's not but like do, uh, like uh, sex in a hundred years is going to be some sort of lost art or something like that. It's uh, fair enough. Fair enough. Fair enough. The, yeah, in a, in a, what I'm saying is that they will have uh, the the ones that would still remain in business. They will have to uh, somehow adapt to add some perks that probably aren't even considered right now in the prostitution business, or if they are, they're a minority and they will have to become the norm. I don't know. I I think any sort of perks you can think of have already been uh, been considered. So if... By some people, I mean. Uh, fair enough. Fair I, enough. I, I, don't, I don't think there's any conceivable sexual practice that hasn't been thought up yet. 
<laughs> Fair enough. That's why I said uh, if they have been, then probably they were. You're right about that. Uh, they're probably still a minority now, and they would have to become much more normative uh, to adapt to the uh, a smaller and more niched market than it is now. Okay. I think you've talked enough about prostitution for one ep one episode. <laughs> So what? I was about. I, I, I was going now to get to the point of the. Uh, you you said that they, they, the the uh, the providers of this service they say oh it's very realistic but they're really not uh, true but I think they they can already have uh, reproduce at least the skin touch much better than five years ago and yeah. I, I I read a few days ago a report I think it was on Breitbart. Um, Next next month, uh, another American company is launching something even better than this, and it already has uh, a software that can speak and they can actually give you an opinion. It won't be the robot's opinion. Uh, so the uh, our dear Janet, the thirty, uh, the uh, prostitute with over thirty years in, in the industry, can stay calm at least for now. But it will provide you an opinion with an opinion. Yeah, and I mean. You're you're not paying a prostitute to give you her honest opinion. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that that's why I don't I I I didn't understand the uh, the argument with the with the opinion. I mean, yeah. So what? It's not gonna give you on the the bot's opinion. So feature, not a bug. <laughs> yep. <laughs> But nevertheless, these kinds of uh, the, the issue of sex dolls will have to uh, come around uh, much more often. It, it is evolving at a, at a remarkable pace. I mean, uh, three years ago it was futuristic speech. Now uh, we get uh, we already have at least three countries that have or have had uh, at least one brothel with sex dolls. I, I presume in ten years they will be significantly more advanced than they already are. Yeah, and it's also going to be some sort of uh, you know virtual reality porn that uh, um, is, is also that advancing at a. Doesn't that already exist now? Yeah, it's some some sort of price like that already exists. Yes. Because I I know there there are some VR helmets for sale, and yeah. according to the manufacturers, um, mm -hmm. around eighty percent of the buyers and. Uh, they they ask the buyers to fill a quiz, and 80% of the buyers uh, that did fill the quiz, they're like, I'm using it for porn. Uh, I, guess <laughs> I, I guess I could take them at face value. I mean, at the end of the day, the internet is for porn, so... <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, so, uh, uh, these, the, for anyone who's disgusted by this particular discussion, uh, good luck with that because these kinds of things will still keep on coming up in the next 10 years for sure. It's, it, this discussion is not going to die. It will, it will only get more mainstream. For now, it's yeah. only a tiny podcast and uh, an article that we laugh at at the Express. But then again, three years ago, it was only a few corners of the internet. Uh, this, this thing is coming. Yeah, at the end of the day, human beings are sexually reproducing animals. We're selected by by natural selection to um, to like sex to 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 seek sex uh, a lot and yeah. uh, of, of course you know, evolution did not you know foresee the the emergence of uh, you know pornography and uh, um, contraceptive and all and all that so it's, um, engaging in VR sex is not going to uh, lead to reproductive success but uh, we still like it, and uh, people may, may be disgusted by it, but uh, that's just the way human beings are. Yeah, no, now, now that you mentioned it, uh, I don't understand this particular fear that I've seen it expressed in several forums. That, oh my god, the, uh, these particular technologies will replace uh, sex. And well, I'm preparing a video in, in defense of pornography, by the way, because <clears throat> another US state passed a resolution uh, trying to declare porn as um, uh, as a health issue, I think, or a health scandal, or something like that. Uh, and I don't understand this particular fear by uh, both by some politicians, but also by uh, many, you know, regular Jays and Janes and those. I don't think it is the case. I mean, pornography has been around for at least 150 years, if not more. Um, the pornography the way we imagine it today has also been around for at least 40 years probably oh actually more a lot more than 40 years uh, I mean it depends it, on what you consider pornography 
uh, probably pornography in its earliest forms uh, are almost as as, as old as uh, human beings. Oh yeah, if you if you if you consider the proto sexual images in the caves and whatnot, it's thousands upon thousands of years old for sure. Uh, but I'm I'm referring to some to, to things a little bit more explicit, like uh, pictures and magazines with the. Uh, um, with sexually uh, suggestive images and whatnot. These kinds of things have been around for at least 150 years. And video pornography has been around since at least the 50s. Uh, for instance, in, in Belgrade, in communist Yugoslavia, there was a cinema, a, a, a cinema theater dedicated exclusively to porn opened in 1969. So, you know, it's almost 50 years ago. These kinds of things did not, for some reason, did, uh, did, did not uh, draw away people from sex. It, it, it did not replace sex. And I don't think these uh, new technologies would do that either. I just don't think so. That's why I don't understand the, the fear expressed by... I guess it's just a natural fear of new technologies. I don't know. I mean, I, I guess to a certain extent they are, of course, a substitute for sex. Um, but I don't see why that's such a huge problem. Mm. Yeah, just because there are a substitute for sex, that doesn't mean the, the good old sex will go away. The, the, the two are not, uh, it's not an either or situation. You know, human beings can do both things or more things at once during uh, the course of a day or a month. Yeah, I guess it, it would probably uh, decrease the amount of sex people have. Um, the same way that, uh, I would say, watching uh, television for entertainment is a. Uh, uh, substitute for reading books mm -hmm. and i guess it's, it's probably true that uh, the advent of, of television reduced the amount of time that people spend reading books uh, reduced it below what it would otherwise have been um but i still don't think don't see why this is some sort of huge crisis mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah Anyway, I guess we're gonna uh, talk about this a lot more in the in the coming uh, months and uh, and years for sure um, okay, let's go to the last one, which is from the very, very <laughs> silly place. Go ahead, please. From the Daily Wire. Cosmo. Men are sexist if they enjoy giving their female partners sexual pleasure. This week in feminism, Cosmopol Cosmopolitan magazine explains where men are sexist if they enjoy giving their female partners sexual pleasure. Yes, really. Quote. It's not enough that men are already having more orgasms than women. To make matters worse, a new study published in the Journal of Sex Research found, aside from deriving pleasure from their orgasms, obviously, men also derive a specific sort of masculine pleasure from making their female partners orgasm, complains Cosmo Sex and Relationship editor Hannah Smothers. Naturally, men enjoy sex more when their female partner has an orgasm. This is what the study has dubbed masculinity achievement. Smother says that there's nothing wrong with, with feeling good about making your partner feel good, before explaining why it's actually sexist. First, the researchers conclude that the increased attention spent on women's orgasms is actually also benefiting men. Quote, despite increasing focus on women's orgasms, research indicated the increased attention to women's orgasms may also serve men's sexuality complicating conceptualizations of women's orgasms as women-centric. This is not good, since we all know how evil men are. Second, it's sexist because men enjoy their significant other's orgasms, uh, sorry, because men enjoying their significant other's orgasm, quote, ties into cultural ideas of women as passive recipients of whatever men give them. One reason is that it might pressure some uh, a heterosexual men to feel like they have to give women orgasms as if orgasms is something a man pulled out of a hat and presented to women, they wrote. This ties into cultural ideas of women as passive recipients of whatever men give them. The Cosmo editor also notes that said enjoyment allegedly perpetuates sexist tropes relative to the female orgasm, such as women feeling pressure to uh, fake orgasms in order to appease a male partner, or in other words, to protect men's feelings. The researchers conclude, according to Smothers, that when women's orgasms begin to serve as a masculinity achievement for, female, uh, sorry, for male partners, the orgasms cease to be about women's liberation or sexual pleasure. Uh, 
but just become another opportunity for men to flex up or show up their sense of masculinity. The feminist Taliban have spoken. Sexist men must stop enjoying giving women pleasure. We look forward to Cosmos, why it's sexist that guys don't get turned on when you orgasm article next week. <laughs> <sighs> the reason this is relevant is because this particular rag, Cosmo, still has an enormous amount of reach. Uh, I mean, I would have expected the amount of stupidity that they published would have eventually shrink their audience. And uh, it did, in the sense that it stopped their growth. But it's still remarkably well-read. It's still remarkably big. And this particular nonsense, I, this is the kind of nonsense that I rather uh, published or said about sex that I actually think it's uh, it's much more uh, pernicious and dangerous than anything the sex dolls and the VR porn and the, all the other pr producers would do. Yeah, it, it basically turns sex into a competition of who can have more pleasure or something like that. Yeah, yeah. Not only that, but... It, Oh, anyway. I mean, sh shouldn't it be a good thing that men also take pleasure from uh, pleasing their partners? Yeah. Surely they... that, that's more pleasure. It should, should be a good thing. Yeah. Uh, it, it does show, and this is not new. I mean, I, uh, I, I looked up into the original thread on, uh, on this particular rag's uh, original uh, uh, posting on Facebook, I think. Uh, and there are there were many uh, middle-aged or anyway somewhat older people, you know, thirty or older, uh, who were looking at it and I was like, "What the fuck? I used to read this when I was a teenager. It, it just I don't remember it being that bad. Maybe the magazine overall. Uh, if at some moment in time, this particular place has been taken over by people who legitimately seem to just hate men. Period." Uh, and you can see it in the language. Uh, the increased attention of women's organs may also serve men's sexuality. Let's assume that's true. So what? Why is that a problem? Yeah, and I'm uh, pretty sure that uh, women also feel good about giving their partners uh, sexual pleasure. Yeah. Is, is that something also a problem? Yeah, because it's male-centric. You can't win with, with these people. <laughs> Because it, it it does say lower in the article that uh, allegedly this uh, uh, quote unquote issue um, it, I, per allegedly perpetrates tropes uh, such as women feeling pressure to fake orgasms in order to protect men's feelings. Uh, no, it doesn't. No, it doesn't. And even if it were, uh, wouldn't you be better served? Uh, Considering, because again, this is a magazine that, uh, at least in its early days, was used to be read by um, late teenagers and early twenties uh, females. Uh, wouldn't you be better served trying to address that particular issue rather than peddling misandry? Somewhere along the so, somewhere on the along the way, the, um, this all all of this thing s stopped being about helping women in any way, and just promoting <clears throat> naked misery. Yeah, it's it's just this really pernicious, uh, serious um, mm -hmm. thinking that uh, you know if. If 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 men derive some sort of uh, benefit, then that obviously must be bad because it somehow magically means that women lose something. Mm -hmm. But no, that's not the case. It's uh, definitely not the case here. Here are some games are extremely rare in reality. Usually, you have either positive sum games, as uh, sex usually is, if it's you know mutually um, pleasurable, um, or your know, negative sum games you know, in crime and war and so on. But the zero sum games where you know, one person's gain is another person's loss are quite rare. Yeah, yeah, they are. Uh, what 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 is a little bit more uh, pernicious is uh, is the is the fact that this particular kind of narrative uh, 
just refuses to die. The only good news is that as opposed to several years ago when the exact same or very similar, not the exact same, but very similar claptrap used to be published, at least there is some backlash to it. Um, <clears throat> so I guess there is some progress to that. But otherwise, th this particular kind of narrative has been around for uh, for many years. And what I don't understand with res respect to uh, specifically to the topic of women's orgasms, they uh, when feminists write about this thing, they act as if the whole concept didn't exist before the 70s or something. Uh, I don't understand where this, where does this coming from? Well, why do so many modern humans tend to have this uh, uh, very distorted and uh, mostly false idea that they somehow, uh, I don't know, invented the wheel or something, or in this case, uh, invented or augmented female orgasm? Uh, that just doesn't work like that. Yeah, I was always in the, in the impression that uh, um, female orgasm was an invention of the, of the second wave feminist movement, but... Uh, <laughs> uh, the not. thing is that many people actually do believe that. Uh, they, they, tend, they really do believe, not necessarily, not that they invented it, but uh, that definitely there was no awareness of its existence, uh, general awareness of its existence. It's just something that uh women should owe to the second wave feminism which is just insane it's just not the case yeah also sometimes people have this sort of mistaken impression that uh, um sex in the past was uh well, the people in the past were all extremely prudish as as they were say in, in the victorian era um but that, that's not a representation of the history as a whole um no, at, at some point, sometimes some cultures, people were prudish, at other times not. It's uh, History is a pretty big place. There's a lot of different attitudes uh, towards sex uh, that uh, prevail at different times and places. And uh, this idea yes. that. Uh, and let's not forget that the Victorian. The sexual pleasure in the past is just uh, mm -hmm. completely wrong. Yeah, and let's not forget that the Victorian era was really uh, in full swing in modern day United Kingdom. Can you still hear me? So I can't hear you. Hello? Why was it the need in 1910, 1920s to emerge um, <clears throat> Uh, movements such as the social purity movement and social in late 19th century, early 20th century was uh, a euphemism for sexual. Uh, <clears throat> and you know, and the, you know, the goals of the social purity movement was, you know, ban prostitution, ban pornography, um, raise the ages of consent, uh, things like that. Why did they exist? Why did they have to appear uh, just a little bit after Queen Victoria died? If the... Uh, um, if the uh, ideas of the uh, Victorian era were indeed white, that widespread, which is which leads me to believe that they weren't that widespread, and if you go if you dig in a little bit deeper, you will find uh, works of art, uh, visual art, and novels and whatnot with very explicit sexual content written in the 19th century uh, in the United States and in 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 other places that were more or less influenced by uh, by England. Uh, and again, if you look outside of the English-speaking culture, there's a, there's an enormous amount of um, of evidence that things weren't really that prudish as feminists would have us believe. Yeah, I mean, uh, either either you cut out uh, during that explanation, or I did. Uh, I didn't get like twenty or thirty seconds of what you said there, but. Uh... I think it, it's yeah, I was saying the. Uh, let me repeat somewhat. I, I was. I said that. I, I definitely. I didn't cut out. Um, if the ideas of the Victorian era were indeed that uh, widespread as feminists would have us believe, then why movements such as the social purity movement, which was essentially the sexual purity movement, social was a euphemism for sexual in their time. Uh, why did those movements have to emerge right after Queen Victoria died? Uh, if those ideas were so pernicious, then there would have been no need for the social purity movement. Uh, yet that movement emerged, and uh, uh, they were fighting against uh, 
widespread pornography as they believed it, widespread prostitution, uh, and also they were fighting for other kinds of things, uh, you know, such as raising the ages of consent, banning prostitution and whatnot. If the Victorian behavior was indeed that widespread uh, and not restricted to some sections of England and the aristocracy, then why did those movements emerge? And the fact that those movements did emerge leads me to believe that the uh, Victorian era wasn't really that Victorian for most people. Yeah, I mean, there's sort of the tendency to uh, look at what uh, some of the more influential people at the top did and let's conclude that it's uh, true for everyone else too. But uh, well, for most people, um, for ordinary people there, their sex lives probably weren't very much different from the sex lives of people today. Yeah. Or the or the sex lives of those in the 17th century or the 15th century. Yeah. Uh, I, I just don't think it is that much of a uh, of an issue. But <laughs> as we were saying before, uh, we are now led to believe that uh, all of these things are just uh, you know the was a huge enlightenment provided to us by the militant femi feminists of the 70s. It's just it's just all all, all of it is garbage. Um, yep. So yeah, and again, why do uh, what I find it a little bit dangerous if these kinds of ideas now? Thank goodness there is backlash. They they, they used to no there used to be no no significant back backlash just five years ago. Thank goodness there is some backlash, but I still think it is dangerous if enough teenagers, uh, both teenage boys and teenage girls, uh, grow up with these kinds of ideas that sex is a competition, a zero sum competition, and because you know. Uh, if you buy into their narrative for 10 seconds, uh, the first obvious question is how the hell do you win? Uh, if you don't care about whether she orgasms or not, uh, you're obviously evil. Uh, if you do care and uh, derive pleasure from it, uh, that's obviously sexist and that's obviously evil. Uh, how exactly do you win? I guess uh, you just have to um, uh, treat uh, getting her to orgasm as some sort of grim duty that you have to fulfill, but you have to take no pleasure in it. To treat it like a chore, something like that, yeah. But that that sounds like that sounds horrible. I mean, the second you get yeah, that's the point, I guess. <laughs> yeah, but it is horrible. I mean, if you if you're doing sex as a chore, eh, eh, what's the point of it? <laughs> amazing, amazing. Ah. All right, I guess we're. Uh, we already poked fun enough at Cosmo. I mean, it, it is really hard to treat Cosmo seriously, but my point is that we sh kind of should, uh, but not seriously in the sense that we can ex ex treat their arguments as serious intellectual. Uh, it's not. Uh, but treat them seriously in the sense that they're, they are quite influential, and some, uh, at least from time to time, someone will have to debunk their bullshit. Even if uh, only a tiny portion of the people who read the original article end up reading the debunking, it's or hearing the debunking, it's still better than no debunking. Yep. Then I'm out of uh, I'm out of things to say, uh, other than the fact that I I will be here on March the thirty first. So. Yeah. Same here. Um, so see you in one week's time, and until then, take the red pill. Take the red pill. Goodbye, everyone.